Good morning. Good morning. If you would open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. We will continue in our story of the life of Naaman. Second Kings chapter 5, and I'm going to read the first nine verses. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel, and the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man does send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he said to the king, saying, Wherewith hath, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you once again that you have seen fit that we should gather together once again today to study your word. We thank you for this word concerning Naaman because there's so much in it that we can relate to. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us the privilege of studying your word together. And so now we ask, Lord, that you would give us understanding as we come to this portion of your word, that you would give us understanding by the person of your Holy Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we began our study of Naaman the Syrian. Naaman had leprosy. We saw that God intended for leprosy to be a picture of sin. God intended for leprosy to be a picture of natural man corrupted by sin and unfit for the presence of God. And the most fearful thing of all, as far as man was concerned, his leprosy was incurable. Man is incapable of ridding himself of this disease. Naaman found out that no matter what plan he followed, no matter what attempts he made, he could not rid himself of this condition. There was no cure for this condition. Leprosy is a graphic picture of our 
old sin nature. There is no deliverance from sin. There is no salvation for our soul by anything that we can do. For Naaman, there was no physician in Syria who could bring about a cure. No matter how much money Naaman was willing to offer, no matter what quack doctor he might have gone to, nothing could help him. And it's the same thing with us by nature. Our spiritual disease, it's a disease of sin, and it lies deeper than any human hand can reach. Amen. Our condition is too desperate for any religious practitioner to cure. True. Under the Old Testament law, no remedy was provided for this awful disease. No directions were given to the priesthood to bring about a cure. The healing of the leper was left entirely to God. All the priest could do was to examine the leper and see the symptoms. All the priest could do was to exclude him from the temple and leave it all up to the Lord. If the leper was ever to find a cure, it would have to be by a miracle of God. Amen. If you and I are to be cured of our sin condition, it will require a miracle of the grace of God. Amen. Naaman was a great man in his nation. He was well respected by his king. He had everything that a man could want for in life, but Naaman was a leper. Verse 2, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Israel was disobedient and the king of Israel was wicked the Syrian army came in and took captives from Israel and among them was this little girl she ended up in Naaman's household I'd like for you to look at this contrast Naaman was a Gentile this little girl was a Jew he was a great man, and she was just a little girl. His name was Naaman. She is unnamed in Scripture. He was captain of the host of the army of Syria, and she was a captive in enemy territory. Naaman was a leper. And she was to be an instrument in his healing. That's God's way. God makes use of the weak and the feeble and the despised. God uses circumstances that seem strange to our way of thinking. Try to visualize this scene if you will. One morning, suddenly, peace was broken there in Syria, in uh, Samaria. You could hear the tramp, tramp, tramp of the Syrian army as they invaded backslidden Israel. And this time, God was silent. This time, God permitted Naaman to carry away some of God's own covenant people, including this little Hebrew girl. This may not mean much to you today, but uh, what about her parents? Their little daughter was ruthlessly snatched away from them, and their home was left desolate 
Just think of the anguish of that poor mother, wondering what would become of her little girl. Her father was grief-stricken because there was nothing that he could do to help her. And what did this little girl feel as she was being taken away? She and her parents were no, no doubt perplexed. Why, oh why? They must have asked it a hundred times. Why? Why had God allowed the joy of their home to suddenly be shattered? Why was this little girl now a servant, a servant in Naaman's household? Why must be she be separated from her parents? Why this cruel captivity? Do you see the point that I'm getting at? God had good reason for this trial. God was shaping things in his own unfathomable way to accomplish his own good and wise purposes. Nothing happens in this world by mere chance. God has planned every detail of our lives. Scripture says he hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. It was God who determined that this little maid would become a member of Naaman's household. Why do you think God would do that? So that she could be a link in the chain which ended not only in the healing of Naaman's leprosy, but also most probably ending in the salvation of his soul. God has a wise and a good reason for every trial that comes into our lives. Amen. Sometimes the reason for the trial is hidden from us. That's God's way of teaching us faith and patience. God had good reason for allowing distress to come to this Hebrew family. God had good reason for allowing whatever sorrow has entered into your life as well. This incident is recorded in the scriptures. He says that the Things that are recorded in the Old Testament are for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Verse 3, And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Now you might think that humanly speaking, this little girl would hate Naaman. You might expect her to be glad that he has leprosy. But this little girl was concerned about Naaman's condition. Apparently she had been brought up in the nurture of the Lord. Amen. Apparently the seed that had been planted by her godly parents had now sprung up and bore fruit. When you think of the way we act when things come into our lives that we don't like, instead of being a blessing to the people around us, so often we grumble and complain because of our circumstances. This little girl is in a tough situation. She was away from her family. She was a slave girl in a foreign land. But she's not complaining. She's not bitter against her captors. Instead, she's faithful in her testimony. And she wants to see Naaman healed. So she says in verse 3, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. 
you would expect that nobody would pay any attention to a little slave girl and what she had to say. And even if they heard her, surely they would just call it some kind of silly talk. After all, the best doctors in all of Syria could not cure leprosy. Certainly no one from another religion over in despised Samaria would be able to heal him. But strange as it seems, her words were heard. Somebody was listening. Why do you think that was? Friends, that was the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. You know, the most faithful sermon that Pastor Randy ever preaches would fall on deaf ears unless the Holy Spirit were at work opening ears and hearts. Amen. The simple words of a child can be effectual when the Holy Spirit is at work. The little girl's words were spoken to her mistress. Naaman's wife told someone else, and then this person went and told it to the king. So we see another link in the chain that eventually brought Naaman to Elisha to be healed. In faith, the little girl spoke a little maid in captivity. Who would expect her to do service for the Lord? Who would be inclined to listen to her? But she used her opportunity and bore witness right there where she was. That's another lesson for you and me. Verse 5, And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter under the king of Israel. We see the hand of the Lord here too. If he had not worked in the heart of this king, the words of the little girl would have gone unnoticed and would have no effect upon him. You see, when God is ready to show mercy, he works at both ends of the line. He gives the message to the messenger and at the same time, he opens up the heart of the recipient. Sure. Over in the New Testament, the Lord told Philip to go out into the desert and speak to the Ethiopian eunuch. At the same time, he was preparing the heart of the Ethiopian eunuch to receive the words of Philip. The little girl spoke about the prophet that is in Samaria. She didn't say the king of Israel had the cure, but old Ben Hadad, this heathen king of Syria, he got it wrong, and he sent Naaman off to the wrong person. Oh, how, the true, how true to life that is. How often is the sinner who has been awakened to his desperate condition. How often is he given wrong advice and sent off to the wrong place? Amen. Like the old woman in Mark chapter 5 who tried many physicians in vain before she finally came to Christ. How often have we heard it right here? I tried this religion and I tried that religion and I went to the church over here and then I went to this other church over on the other side of town and finally I ended up here where I could hear the word preach. Amen. Verse 5 it says that he that is Naaman and he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. Today that might be worth over a quarter of a million dollars. The little girl had said nothing about the need for silver and gold. But Naaman didn't know anything about the grace of God. 
He was prepared to pay and to pay handsomely for his own healing. Again, how true to life that is. How many still think that the gift of God can be bought? Oh, maybe not with silver and gold. But if you can just do enough good things in your life, maybe you'll be able to get to heaven. Verse 6, And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now, when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman, my servant, to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. The king got it wrong, you see. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he rent his clothes, and he said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man thus sent unto me? to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. You know, that's just pitiful. Amen. You might excuse the king of Syria for getting it wrong. He was a heathen. But this is the king of Israel and instead of him getting down on his knees and spreading out that letter before the Lord, the way old Hezekiah did it, this old apostate king Jehoram was acting just like an unbelieving infidel. Instead of seeing this as an opportunity for Jehovah God to show his grace and glory, this old wicked king of Israel thought only of himself. He saw nothing in this letter but a veiled threat from the king of Syria designed to humiliate him and now he's afraid. It never occurred to the king of Israel to honor the God of Israel. It never occurred to him to call in God's prophet Elisha. Elisha was well known throughout the land. Elisha had already raised up a dead child to life. You would think that that would authenticate him as a man of God. But even things like that mean nothing to the ungodly. The Lord Jesus publicly raised up a dead man to life, and yet in just a few days, they were calling for his crucifixion. All oh, the wickedness of the heart of unregenerate man. We read in Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means that the carnal mind is filled with hatred against God. Elisha had proved himself to be an extraordinary man of God. Elisha, Elisha has shown himself to be a prophet of God. But he was nothing to this king who thought only of himself. But Elisha put all of that aside and went to the king. Elisha was not concerned with his own feelings. It didn't matter to him that he had been ignored by the king. Elisha was more interested in the glory of God. Verse 8, And it was so, when Elisha the man of God had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he went to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him now come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Amen. <clears throat> when Elisha heard about the letter, our text says he went to the king. Elisha said to old king Jehoram, Why have you torn your clothes? All you had to do was send him to me. Elisha said to the king, send him to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Elisha did not want Naaman to go back to Syria disappointed. 
He didn't want Naaman to think that Israel's God was impotent like the gods of Syria. <laughs> Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Naaman. Next week, we're going to see the healing of Naaman's leprosy at the word of the prophet of God. Brother Red, would you lead us in prayer? Father God, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you for this time that we can gather in here to worship you. I pray our hearts would be open for the service to follow. I pray the Holy Spirit would guide us in all things that we say or do. Lord, we love you, and that's why we're here today to worship and praise you. So open our hearts that we might receive your message today, Lord. We give you praise and glory in Jesus' name.